Good afternoon. Thanks so much for coming uh, to this event, which we look forward to every year, our Affiliates Research Day. Uh, and I hope you're enjoying the talks and that many of you will join tonight for the poster se session. Um, I'm very happy to, to introduce today's uh, speaker, Tim Althoff, who's a new, where is Tim? <laughs> a new young hot professor <laughs> in the Allen School. Um, as you'll hear, Tim's work uh, has to do with data science for social good. Uh, he did his undergraduate and master's degree uh, in Germany before coming to the US uh, to go to Stanford where he did an MS and PhD uh, working with Yuri Leskovic, who many of you know. And actually we have another faculty member uh, who will be joining us next year who's doing a postdoc, uh, Amy Zhang, with, with Yuri. Um, so anyway, we're very excited to have Tim here, and I hope you enjoy the talk. Yeah. Thank you, Hank. Uh, thanks, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, welcome from my side to the, the Allen School and, and uh, to the research day. And I'm excited uh, today to tell you about a bit of our recent research on data science for social good or data science for human well-being. And around lunch, I was looking around a bit. I saw quite a few, I know, phones or wearable devices. I'm wearing both of those now. And kind of the, the development that so many of us walk around with these devices right now is, is terribly exciting to us. Um, for instance, uh, they are, these kind of devices are increasingly prevalent in countries uh, like here in the United States. 70% of adults or more um, uh, own a smartphone today. In developing economies, that number is about half, and both numbers are rapidly, rapidly growing. And this is super exciting to us because in, in kind of walking around with our smartphones and wearable devices, these devices actually generate massive digital traces of our behavior in the real world um, um, and our health. And there's kind of really rich multimodal data that these uh, devices can, can provide. They range from uh, sensor data, like, like the accelerometry in these devices, to tell whether you're taking steps to how people are using those devices in the first place. They can even capture our social interactions or, or language patterns. Um, and this gets more exciting because we don't even have to go out and like, collect all this data. In, in many, many cases, uh, this activity in health data has already been recorded for millions and millions of people, which allows us to uh, s do studies at massive scale, uh, studying people's behavior in really granular detail, uh, doing that over like continuously and over long periods of time, and uh, getting that at a fairly low cost. Um, and this is a big deal, especially when you think about how behavioral health research is, is done today. Um, often we would be confined to a laboratory setting if we want to study certain behaviors. Even when we can escape those laboratory settings, we would study a, a small number of people for a fairly short amount of time. In many studies we would um, uh, only capture people's behavior in a binary setting, like do you consider yourself active or non-active? And depending on the exact question that you're asking, uh, there have been studies where these self-reports can be amazingly off, and in some cases up to 700% uh, off. Um, and, and it's fairly expensive to do so. Um, what that results in, like all these challenges result in that we actually don't know a whole lot about our behaviors and health and how our behaviors re relate to our health. Uh, for instance, we, we don't have fantastic answers to how much do people actually exercise, like how are they sleeping, uh, what, are, what are people struggling with. Um, and I think there's a great opportunity in, in using all these digital traces to help Im improve uh, human well-being uh, to both advance science through a, through a better understanding of, of these human behaviors, as well as um, um, thinking about how these uh, can actively improve healthcare settings through the actual insights that we can derive from, from these data sets. So in, in our research group, we develop computational methods uh, for these digital activity traces, always with the goal of better understanding and improving human uh, well-being. And we tend to do that with uh, large-scale data sets capturing billions of actions by, by millions of people. We use then those data sets to uh, conduct massive observational studies uh, where the goal is actionable insights uh, about our health and well-being to, to uh, impact health research. So in, in uh, kind of today's lunch talk, I want to give you three different examples um, um, for, for how this can look like across different, um, uh, different behaviors from physical activity uh, to sleep, and, and the third example will be about mental health. 
So the for the first one, we'll look at global physical activity. It turns out we don't actually know how much exercise uh, people really get. Like the World Health Organization spends a lot of money in, in, knowing, uh, in knowing the answer to this question in funding studies and aggregating lots of studies together. And they, for instance, uh, Hank mentioned I'm from Germany. In Germany, they, uh, um, they don't know whether it's like 5% or 50% of Germans that don't get enough physical activity, even with all the studies have been done precisely through the, the small scale. We wanted to kind of use the fact that smartphones kind of walk uh, across the face of the earth a lot uh, to better understand how physically active people are in different environments. And we worked with a company called Azumio. Uh, they have a fairly popular smartphone app uh, that uh, allows you to um, uh, track your different behaviors and activities. And um, kind of each of these little hexagons would be a uh, different activity, like how many steps you took, running, eating, sleeping, and so on. Um, and about 5 million people are using this app in about 120 different countries, allowing us a global perspective on how active people are. They recorded about 800 million of these little uh, hexagons, including 160 million days of, of tracking your steps at a minute-by-minute -minute resolution, which comes down to a little over 200 billion uh, individual data points of, of time-stamped, geolocalized physical activity. And kind of this allowed us for the first time in scientific history to actually kind of uh, paint a picture of how active people are across the globe. Um, this is the average number of steps people take uh, in, in color. Uh, for instance, we saw, um, maybe not too surprisingly, in, in the United States, we're not the most active on, on, the, on the planet. People are a bit more active in Europe, um, Russia, China, um, Japan, uh, less, um, less active in, in Southeast Asia. But really, the most interesting insights that came from, from this rich, rich data set weren't kind of in these highly aggregated perspectives. The most interesting part for us was when we looked Kind of in kind of for each individual country, how was physical activity actually distributed within these different countries? So here I'm taking four example countries: um, uh, Japan, UK, US, and Saudi Arabia, and I'm showing you the full distribution of physical activity. It turns out there's not too many people that get 10,000 steps on average uh, every day, um, and kind of we see those curves she, like they seem shifted around. So there's clearly like a, a difference in means, but we all we already saw that on, on the previous slide. The exciting part uh, in this study was that for the first time we could really think about the tails of this distribution, the extremes, and understand how many people get very little steps or, or very many. Um, and it allowed us to ask new questions, like how, act, uh, how evenly or unevenly is physical activity actually distributed um, in the population for, for this country. And um, here I'm showing you the same four curves. I'm just aligning them by the mode or by the, by the tip of the distribution uh, so we can visually compare the, the tails of the um, distributions easier. And if you look in orange here in Saudi Arabia, they have kind of the fattest uh, tails in, in the distribution, both on the right hand and the left hand side. So what this means is there's a lot of people in Saudi Arabia that get way more activity than what's typical in Saudi Arabia. There's also more people that get way less activity than what's typical. And you can consider this variance, or you can consider this an inequality in how physical activity is, is distributed. And that varies from country to country. Uh, we like numbers. Uh, you can put a number on how, unequally, uh, this, how unequal this distribution is. Um, for instance, using a Gini coefficient, which is very common in uh, income inequality, for instance. So we'll, we'll see some countries, some will be on this end, where they're kind of more equal, a more equal distribution of physical activity, and kind of a less equal uh, distribution over here. We call this activity inequality, and we were pretty excited when we saw this. Uh, um, it actually turns out that this activity inequality concept was an amazing predictor of obesity levels uh, worldwide. If you look at the top uh, right corner, there's Saudi Arabia. They didn't only have like the, the fattest, distribution, uh, fattest tails in the distribution, but also among the highest obesity levels. On the left-hand side, Japan was in blue, fairly narrow distribution. Um, they didn't only have the most narrow distribution, they all also had much lower obesity levels. I think the exciting thing for computer scientists here is um, this type of study was uniquely enabled by kind of the massive digital traces that, that come from, from wearables, from, from mobile devices, um, uh, and allowed us to reveal a health inequality that previously we just didn't know about because we never had a chance uh, to actually measure these types of behaviors at, at this scale. What we're now doing is we're trying to 
take this data um, and understand also our environment. How, how does our environment actually influences our own behavior? How do the cities we live in influence our behavior and through that our health? And we can actually use some of this data uh, to do, um, work towards kind of a data-driven design um, of cities that takes these uh, health behaviors into account. And that takes uh, causal inference methods, um, um, aspects like uh, fairness and machine learning or AI become important where it turns out that these inequalities aren't kind of created equal. They, they tend to uh, affect uh, particular groups. For instance, the inequality I showed you is predominantly uh, due to women getting less physical activity in, in many countries, but often for different uh, reasons. This was kind of the, the first example about physical activity. Uh, now, kind of what, what can these uh, things tell us about our, our sleep? And um, this will be a fun, uh, a fun study where it all started with, uh, we were trying to understand how our own sleep would affect our performance, our job performance, our cognitive performance. Like, how much does it actually matter, like how, how I sleep at night for, for how I'm doing at, at my job? Um, and we're going to try to answer these questions by using, using web search engines. And that sounds a little bit weird, like why would we want to use a web search engines to try and understand people's sleep or job performance? But the interesting thing about web search engines is um, we're all using them. Uh, billions of people use them um, across the planet. We do it uh, many times during the day. And we do it whether we're uh, really awake or whether we're more sleepy. Um, and if there was any way we could reframe the interactions we have with technology, in this case, web search engines, if there was any way for us to reframe our interactions as a series of performance tasks, we would be in a lucky situation where we would already have billions and billions of measurements recorded to help us answer this question. Actually, turns out this works really well. Um, for instance, we can look at how fast are people typing throughout the day into a web search engine. How, uh, how long does it take them to think about which result they want to click on? Um, and all of these things are measured billions of times already, millisecond by millisecond. So here I'm showing you um, for the Bing search engine, how fast are people typing into Bing uh, throughout the, the 24 hours of the day? Uh, average is maybe 240 milliseconds. This makes sense for like an average uh, typist. Um, and what jumps out at us, this is, this is not a flat line at all. Or like maybe we think we're like equally good at using Bing or whatever your favorite search engine is um, uh, throughout the day. This is really not the case. There's about a 30% amplitude. Um, this matches the 30% variation that's typically seen in a laboratory uh, environment of how much human performance typically varies in those settings. Um, and we're really slow here at 4 a.m. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why we could be being slow. Um, one is maybe this is people that have been awake for a really, really long time and you just don't get any faster. Um, maybe it's because people um, um, are always slow at 4 a.m. It's just the wrong time for us. It's not a great time for me personally. Um, or maybe it's uh, because somebody just got up and we're just a little bit um, slower right after getting up. Um, all of these things are possible. They're all biologically plausible. Um, and from just this data alone, we can't actually disentangle these factors. Uh, we needed um, more to disentangle them. Precisely, we needed to know when were people sleeping? When were people sleeping in the day relative to when they were uh, using uh, a web search engine? And um, in this study, the study was the first combination of web search data with um, uh, wearable devices. Um, so we had objective measurements on when people were actually sleeping. Before I show you some of the results, we'll do kind of a quick primer in, in sleep biology. Um, I'll show you a plot that we'll have on the x-axis time since waking up, and on the y-axis reaction time, how fast, how fast were you typing? And if you ask a sleep biologist, um, they will tell you, we would expect that people, um, that there would be a homeostatic sleep drive. Um, so um, kind of the longer you're awake, the slower and slower and slower and slower you become. They would tell you that there's uh, sleep inertia. So right after waking up, you're actually a bit slower, and it, it takes you a little while to get uh, faster. And typically, in laboratory settings, you would find this um, turning around point at, at two hours, uh, where like you're the best performing uh, right there. Now we did that uh, using kind of millions of keystrokes in, in a web search engine, and we were pretty excited when we saw this. Uh, what we were seeing here is that um, here we're getting up, and then we're actually, actually getting faster, 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 like millisecond by millisecond. Every few minutes we can see people getting faster. 
up until about two hours, and then people get slower and slower and slower and slower again. Um, across kind of a much larger set in the wild um, using a web search engine. So this was nice validation for us. Like this exactly looks like sleep inertia. This exactly looks like a homeostatic sleep drive. So this is good validation that we can actually use these in the wild measurements for these types of studies that were previously done only in sleep labs. And it allows new insights. For one, we can actually do this outside of a, a sleep laboratory uh, now. And if you, if you look closely, in the middle, there's actually also some period of time during the day where people are better performing than kind of the, the basic uh, biological theory would predict right now. Uh, we, we've used this method of kind of using people's kind of typing that they do anyway throughout the day in, in two different ways. For instance, we've used it to understand how does your sleep deprivation um, uh, impact your performance uh, throughout the day, and it allowed us to do this at a much larger scale than the largest study ever funded before. Um, and we've also used it to think about how does this affect accident risk. If typing and, and clicking has anything to do really with your cognitive performance and alertness, it should also have something to do with um, uh, accident risk. And it turns out you can use how fast people are typing to predict accident risk around the country really, really well, even after taking into account lots of important confounders of how many people are actually on the road, how many people live there, how much alcohol abuse is there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're hoping that kind of these type of um, uh, behavioral traces could, for instance, help in, in reducing vehicle accidents in the future. What we're doing right now is we're trying to take this technology of um, kind of understanding how fast you're using pieces of technology to not only think about how fast are you typing, but how, how important is this really to your job performance? Like get a hard job performance measure rather than just like you're typing and, and your clicking speed. And we're working with uh, um, a few NFL athletes and, and salespeople um, to understand kind of how does their sleep affect their performance. Um, just to show you one, one result, it turns out that NFL athletes, um, when they sleep longer, they tend to use their phone faster. And when they use their phone faster, they actually get better, uh, better grades as assigned by, by NFL experts. Um, and they're like better performing uh, kind of on game day by, by a few percent. Um, and I can only speak for myself, but I was really impressed by the Seahawks performance against the 49ers uh, last Monday. Um, maybe they're getting really good sleep. Uh, um, but that was fun. Um, Why are you helping Boston? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> um, so, um, like, we saw an example about physical activity, one about sleep. So there's a lot of aspects of physical health that we can study, kind of through these accelerometry um, settings. Uh, but I think one, one thing that's also close to my heart is we can actually understand people's mental health better through these types of devices as well. Maybe it's, it's not obvious, but you can use mobile devices in mental health care. For instance, your mobile devices enables you access to counseling um, kind of wherever you are, whenever you are. Um, we've partnered with an organization called Crisis Text Line. They are the U.S.'s largest uh, crisis hotline, and they work through text messaging. Um, they're extremely popular, especially with youth. And like on their platform, I think now it might be over 100 million messages that have already been exchanged on their platform. Um, and every day they um, kind of use these messages and this crisis counseling to save people from, from suicides um, uh, several times each day. Now, kind of, this is all through text messaging, which is kind of an interesting medium. Almost as a side product, we get a full transcript of, of the crisis counseling conversation. Um, and after the conversation is over, um, we would reach out to the person texting in and ask, after this conversation, did it make you feel better, uh, same, uh, or worse? So we have this fully observed conversation channel. There is no, there is no kind of face-to-face -face conversation. Um, everything that is actually working must happen somehow through language, and, and we have a fully, um, full observations of, of this language. And this type of data allows us to um, ask and, and address really important questions. For instance, how would you talk to somebody to help them feel better? Um, how is it possible that we have, we have all these counselors, all these therapists, they're amazing. In, in this case, they're all volunteers. They, they take their time for that. They're trained. They're highly motivated. How is it possible that we still see so much variance in kind of the effectiveness of, of their techniques? And we've used this uh, data to, to try, try and get at that from kind of a, a data-driven perspective. And we've developed computational models 
to, uh, to provide quantitative evidence whether certain conversation strategies um, are more effective than others. For instance, we, we, look, um, we ask the question, are people even fully aware that a conversation might not be going well right now? Um, like maybe there are certain cues that maybe you're missing and, and you don't know whether kind of this conversation is currently going really well or, or not so well. And it turned out that the very best, the most effective counselors that were the most um, likely to make somebody feel better, um, they clearly talked differently when the conversation wasn't going well. But the least successful counselors on the platform actually talked just the same, whether it was currently going well or not so well, which is maybe because they, um, they, they're missing some of the cues, maybe they don't know that whether it's currently not going so well, or they, they do see that, but they, they don't know how to, to um, 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 do it differently. Another thing we studied is how, like, how might they be um, responding differently? And um, we, we found that the very best counselors would actually um, react to ambiguity differently. Like they, they would, for instance, che uh, check for suicide ideation much earlier than their uh, less uh, successful counter uh, counterparts. Uh, this I'll come back to. It was interesting to see, we, we developed methods to measure how templated or generic is your language? Like, how would we put a number on this? And it turns out that the most effective counselors were much more personalized, much more creative in, in their responses. Um, and it turned out that people, like clients, really, really hated kind of the, the templated, generic, or robotic language, which cuts a little bit deeper as a computer scientist, I think. Um, and they also would navigate the, the conversation differently. We could model how they navigate kind of through the conversation. Where do, where do they spend the most of their time? And it turns out that the best counselors would spend less time understanding the problem, um, maybe not getting into every detail, but then they would spend a lot more time collaboratively problem solving um, uh, with, the, with the client, which is a plausible reason why they would actually see better outcomes. And the best counselors could even help change somebody's perspective um, in, in terms of whether you're um, stuck in the past or you're only considering yourself. The best counselors, by the way they talked, they would be able to induce, to, um, help people to talk more positively or to consider others or to um, uh, think more about the future. Um, we're excited, like th these types of kind of data-driven insights have concretely changed the way they are training counselors. For instance, like the, the fact about the robotic language is something that they followed up in qualitative research. People really hated that. And this has changed how counselors are being trained on their platform um, today. Um, we're building on this work um, in a variety of ways. Um, uh, mental health care access is a big, big problem, um, even in countries as rich as the United States. Uh, over two-thirds of counties in the United States don't have a single psychiatrist. Um, if you talk to clinical psychologists in, in, the, in the medical school, many of them believe, like, we will never have enough mental health professionals to actually address the need. Um, that just won't happen. Um, this is why we're uh, looking into ways how, um, for instance, like a lot of uh, mental health um, uh, resources you can access online, you can talk to other people, there's a lot of online social networks where you can talk to somebody about what you're struggling with, and they might um, uh, respond to you with, with empathy and, and, and care. And this type of peer-to-peer -peer support may be a kind of a scalable way to help, um, to help with this massive problem of, of mental health care. So we're working with um, uh, clinical psychologists in, in the medical school and uh, uh, with AI2 on trying to understand how we can empower peer supporters to help others in, in crisis better. Um, and we're working with large um, social networks like, like TalkLive or Supportive where millions of people are using these um, apps or these um, online social networks to engage in, in this peer support. And we're trying to figure out how can we figure out what would be a, a helpful answer to this person in this uh, particular situation? Or how can we give people more than just a chat box to help somebody else? Like what other kind of tools and, and help could we provide um, them to, to author a more helpful or more empathetic response? Um, with that, I'm, I'm done. I hope you found this uh, overview helpful and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Um, we have time for a couple questions. I can run around and hand you the mic if there's some questions for Tim. Anyone? All the way at the back. It's not, this <laughs> is non-optimal. <laughs> then somebody in the front, it's a physical activity intervention, okay. yeah. yeah.
<laughs> so I'm curious about how you get the data that you use for these kind of large scale studies. Very cool talk, by the way. Um, and I'm curious about specifically uh, how that uh, process of getting the data interacts with notions of informed consent and other things about the people that you're collecting this data from. Yep, yep. And the question is, how, where do we get kind of this data from? How do you get access to this data? How does this interact with uh, informed consent and so on? Um, that's an important question, of course. Like with, without this data, uh, these, these types of studies wouldn't be, wouldn't be possible. Um, and it varies from, from study to study uh, that I've presented. Um, and uh, quite honestly, that, like, that, that can be a real challenge um, in terms of, of um, how you get access to with this data. In, in any of these cases, these types of studies are enabled uh, through collaborations with different industry partners, for instance, that are building this type of app and they would like to, to, to um, uh, study their, how, how to improve their app, to study their own user population, et cetera. Um, in, in many cases, that uh, comes through the terms of, of service where um, that can be buried and that it might not be the, the best answer we could come up with in terms of, of kind of how to inform people. Um, in other studies that I've showed you, for instance, this, the sleep study, um, everybody opted in to be, be part of the study. Um, so we had um, Bing data, we had uh, Microsoft Band for the wearable device data, um, and we asked people like, hey, we're, we, we want to um, um, uh, do scientific studies on this data. Would you allow us to merge these two data sources? And kind of, um, in kind of um, it, it was kind of a more of an opt-in in type approach in this setting. Any other, other questions? questions? Yes. Going once. Ah, one more. Hang on. Hi. Nice talk. I guess, small question. When you were looking at the Bing data, I assume this is specifically data from one specific device, like from this laptop with this keyboard versus Bing data from people with phone, using phones versus computers, because I imagine that we would type slower on a phone. Yep, yep. Um, it, it's a really, really important question. Uh, the question is, in the Bing data, in the sleep study, when we looked at typing, what devices did those come from? It might be very different on a, on a computer, laptop, phone, et cetera. Um, it, it's actually really important. Our interaction patterns on different devices are wildly different. Um, 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 in the NFL kind of study, we're actually doing it on a mobile device, and how fast are you clicking or swiping on the mobile device? And in the first study, we only use kind of desktop, kind of real, real keyboards. Um, a lot of these things, are like they, they, um, we can capture our real physiology. Like there, um, there are biological factors that make us slower or faster. So there's lots of ways how we could do that. Uh, but you're bringing up an important point. It, like we actually need to understand how those data are being generated. Um, and uh, could it be possible that some of those patterns may just be like different fractions of phone users versus uh, keyboard users, and, and that would actually explain the details. So these types of confounding effects or, or ways to, uh, to get, get the data analysis wrong um, show up in, in any of these studies. I didn't spend a whole lot of time on that. But for instance, like, could it be just like different populations? Even if it's all, like, it was all keyboard users. If it was only keyboard users in the study, are there just fast people and slow people? And at different times of the day, we see more of, of this particular population. That wasn't the case, um, but, but that would be one, like weekday versus weekend effects, um, um, work versus uh, like leisure in, in terms of, um, like there's so many different confounding effects, which, which we did check. Uh, you guys can check, check out the papers. Um, uh, but it's really important to, to be mindful of, of these type of confounding effects. Is there a question? OK, hang on. <laughs> I'm wondering if there's a data set you're really wishing you could get your hands on to, to peek into people's lives that you haven't had access to yet. Yeah, yeah. we try not to peek into people's <laughs> lives. But, um, um, I, I think there's a, a, a few kind of like data sets that we would be really excited about. I think one, um, um, your location, um, kind of your location over time has a tremendous information. Um, especially when we think about like, how does your environment affect your behavior? Like how important is the walkability of Seattle? How important is it that there's a park there or a grocery store there, a school there, and sidewalks here? Um, um, those are like 
important questions we spend billions and billions of, of dollars on, but we don't have amazing data-driven answers. Uh, we're working on some of these, for instance, trying to understand when people move from one city to another, how did their behavior change? But it would be really exciting to have more fine-grained uh, kind of GPS location over time um, to understand that. Um, this, this um, to the first question, this, uh, there's a clear trade-off with privacy there, and that's, that's a major challenge and, and, and need for, for research. Um, but your location captures so much, whether you eat at home or you eat out, whether you shop at Walmart or Whole Foods, um, like where you are over time just tell, tells you a lot about that, that person. Um, um. Let's take one last question. This question is kind of related. Um, I'm seeing you use indirect measures of performance, uh, but we also have other sensors on these devices, including your watch and so on, with heart rate sensors and the camera and so on. Um, what's the potential for getting access to those signals in order to perhaps take an even closer look to the, some of the hidden variables behind yep. what you're observing? Yep. The, the question is like, especially when measuring about performance, there could be lots of other sensor streams rather than, I don't know, how fast people are typing. Like these devices might give you uh, imaging data or um, heart rate data and so on. Um, um, I think there, there is a, a lot of potential. I think the, the, the key idea in our work was there could be non-intrusive measures. Like there, there's lots of, of these, um, there's lots of ways to measure somebody's cognitive performance or alertness right now. A really popular one is called psychomotor vigilance test where you react to stimuli on a screen and you have to like, click really fast. Um, but you have to stop whatever you're doing. Um, so I, I think the, the biggest benefit of, of this type of work that I've presented is it's just like the non-intrusive na nature. We don't need anything that you're not doing right now. We don't need you to stop doing what, what you're doing right now. Um, we can use uh, kind of small repetitive tasks that you repeat every day that we can time to, to understand that variation, for instance. Um, but other streams like heart rate can be really important. For instance, the very first study I showed just all on steps um, I know there's a lot of interesting studies you can do about uh, steps, but like the truth is if we see somebody take 150 steps, um, they're not always created equal. Like they might take those, um, I don't know, like two steps at a time. Uh, they might do it in a minute in a full sprint. Um, after that sprint, I don't know, they, they, their heart might be bursting through their chest or they might be pretty relaxed because they're a, a pro athlete. Um, like these additional signals can, can kind of add to that and really contextualize um, in, in which, for instance, in which context do you see uh, whatever action you saw, whatever performance? Uh, for instance, seeing like after going up the stairs, what is my heart doing? And it might tell you a lot more about that person's um, health. Uh, we did some, some research on that, uh, the heart rate specifically, I'm happy to chat more after. Okay, thank you all for coming to lunch. The next session start in five minutes, so please find another exciting session to go to, and let's thank Tim one more time. Thank you. Yeah.